Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's so lovely to have you here today. Thank you all so much for taking the time. It's an absolute joy to have you. I can already see folks in the chat popping where you're watching from. I can see folks from uh, Delhi, uh, from London, from Canberra, uh, from Cape Town, uh, Berkshire, the Midlands, Didcot, Nottingham, uh, the list goes on. Uh, if you haven't already, <laughs> we've got Paris in capital letters. I cannot ignore that one. Uh, it's so lovely to see you. If you haven't already, please do drop in the chat feature where you're watching from. And while you're doing that, uh, don't forget to switch your messages uh, to everyone so everyone can see your messages, not just the host and panelists. Uh, you'll see the option to switch that in your chat feature right there. We've got a very international audience today. We've got Pat in Munich as well. This is this is just lovely. So thank you all so much for taking the time. It means so, so much. Uh, today's guest, let's get going with some introductions. So today's guest is Gareth Turner. He is the founder of Big Black Door and also a man with an illustrious career. And I can see him shivering at the thought <laughs> yeah. of words uh, already. Having previously been the head of marketing at Weetabix and also held roles at Arla and Heineken. I would also make a joke at this point about him being a Crystal Palace fan, but as I'm a Man United fan, presently he has bragging rights, uh, so that's very uncomfortable. Uh, in this session, we're going to investigate the completely important briefing uh, document and hear Gareth's six tips for making good ones uh, before taking time for Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have questions, do get them in using the Q&A feature uh, that's found in the toolbar down below. We'll take the questions at the end. Um, and there's also a couple of moments of interactivity in the chat feature. So make sure to keep your eyes out for that. Uh, today's feature sponsor is Cambridge Marketing College. Uh, they've just released two short courses, uh, one on carbon literacy for marketers and another on AI for marketers. Cambridge Marketing College have been sponsors of the marketing meetup since day one. They were the first sponsor to ever come into the marketing meetup. And in the journey of eight years, they've supported us relentlessly. So they deserve a lot of praise and they're also doing something good for marketing folk. So if you want to ch check out Cambridge Marketing College and the <clears> two <throat> courses, uh, do take the time. Also, a big thank you to Braze, Exclaimer, uh, Clavio, Impression, Redgate and Storyblock. We'll, uh, we'll hear more about each of those on uh, over the course of time, over the rest of the season, on doing a lot, uh, doing a lot on a little. Um, we've got Emma saying we love Weetabix. Uh, we've got Chris saying I couldn't find my Weetabix this morning, and 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 crying. <laughs> we've got Rupert saying I prefer Heineken for breakfast. So mate, <laughs> we've got we've got a a, a career of uh, folks uh, tuning in for you today, uh, but. Gareth, it's over to you, mate. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, have, yeah, over to you. Thank you, Joe. This is the first stressful moment. Can I can I share? Can everyone see that? See that screen? We've got your desktop, my friend. Okay. So um... okay, jolly good. That's uh, that's good. And of course, you're a Man U fan, Joe. Living in Cambridge, <laughs> of course you are, mate. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> so uh, thank you. I've forgotten about that. That's, uh, yeah, that's a good good way to start. So thank you. I hope everyone's sitting comfortably. Uh, so let's get straight into it. So up front, I'm going to say, uh, don't bother taking too many notes because you know, it's, uh, it's the things available online. Um, but I'm going to make all the content that I share here available on my website, uh, the links and uh, downloads and templates and stuff. So I'll give you the link at that at, at the end. So, um, so stay tuned. And I should also say that my experience is primarily working with third party uh, agencies, not necessarily in house creative teams. So forgive me if I default to using those terms, but the process and the tips that I'm going to talk about today, they're equally applicable for internal and, uh, and external agencies. So just forgive me on that. So um, I want to share uh, one of my most uh, terrifying, uh, terrifying memories as, as a marketeer. We're in uh, this creative presentation and the work is being grandly unveiled. The agency love it. They've put a load of work into it. You can tell, but it's wrong. And I've got this knot in my stomach. I've got the sweaty palms as the agency is slowly working their way around the table, looking for feedback. I, 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 I don't think it's right. I, some, I some, somehow managed to, uh, to summon up the strength 
to say. I, I don't think it's talking enough about taste. And the creative director, right, who sort of five minutes ago just been my bezzy, he'd been all back slappy and jovial, right? He sits bolt upright with his, his arms folded and says, uh, what do you mean? It's about health, like it said in the brief. I go, oh, let's go back to the brief. Then I say, looking all smug, right? And uh, there it was. I'd written exactly what I wanted. But I'd also written a load of other stuff. Uh, and the agency had carefully picked the thing that they found the most interesting, not the bit that I wanted them to talk about. So look, I don't know if that resonates with anyone. If anyone else has uh, had a similar experience, it could just be me, right? Um, but it's not to be repeated. I can assure you, it's not a comfortable situation. So briefs aren't just a brief. They're your strategy on a page. They're your contract with your agency partners. And if we aren't clear with our brief as clients, then how can we expect to get great work? So look, I, I started with this vision of doom, a gloom. And so I thought I'd try and bring us back up, uplift the mood a little bit with uh, um, an experience of when the project worked well. And I'm talking here about one of the favorite, fav my favorite, probably most famous as well, product projects I've ever led, which was uh, the last set of Peter K ads uh, when uh, I worked on the John Smith brand. That was a, if I say so myself, that was a great collaborative brief with all sh uh, stakeholders present and correct and aligned. We had the theater of the brief, we brought it to life. We nailed that briefing process and we nailed that production process actually off the back of it as well. We invested in developing and nurturing a great client agency relationship. And when we briefed that, I got a lot of scripts. These are all the scripts, I've still got them, right? Um, these are all the scripts we got for three ads, about 100, 100 scripts we saw, because the team wanted to work on us, work on that brief. They wanted, they were putting envelopes with scripts underneath the creative director's door. And that uh, resulted in some great commercial work, great uh, work that had a commercial impact and award-winning work. We won the um, a golden arrow for the best 30 second ad. So look, the brief is the most important document we've got. It summarizes what we want from each other. Uh, it summarizes the problems we're looking to solve and what measures of success are gonna be. And the good news is, as Joe says, I've, I've been lucky enough to work in some big brands with a load of training over the last 25, <coughs> 25 years or so, right? Um, I had 14 years at Heineken leading brands like John Smith's and, and Bulmer's. Uh, I had seven years at Isle of Foods in a number of roles, including UK marketing director for the Butters. So Anchor and Lurpak uh, were in there um, and a global head of brand role. And most recently I was at Weetabix uh, where I was head of marketing until I jacked it all in to set up my own strategic marketing agency uh, last year. And now I, I share that experience, that training with, with some of the brands that you see uh, on, on this chart here. So, I've learned my lessons the hard way over the years. Uh, I'm gonna try and distill that 25 years of experience into the next 30 minutes or so, right? So it's uh, so a buckle up. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Turner's top tips, my six step guide to writing a killer brief. So first bit of interaction here, right? I want you to put in the chat, uh, whether you are agency side or client or brand side. I want to get a sense of, uh, of what the split is. Now, as you're doing that, the way I've set my screens up here means I can't see that chat. So I'm looking to Joe to give me um, a crumb of comfort that there may be some clients in the room. <laughs> there is there is definitely a lot of people in the room and uh, they are ch chatting in very, very quick. Um, but it seems like a very even split, potentially okay. towards the client side today, I'd say. Uh, okay. so, but um, yeah, the answer, the answer is <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. So look, um, so it's great. It's great to see um, some some brand side uh, marketeers in in the room. And um, uh, I saw in the chat on some some names I'm familiar with. So thank you guys for, for for supporting. I guess some of you are saying, "That's all right, Gaz. We got this. We're all pretty good at writing briefs. Thanks, thanks for that. We're going to go and clear our inboxes now because we it's a waste of time." But there was some great research from the, Bre the Better Briefs project in 2021, which seemed to, on the face of it, support that perspective. It's definitely a, a great piece of research to read if you haven't already read that. They found that 80% of clients think that they write a great brief. But I'm sorry to be the one to tell the clients uh, in this room 
But agencies think your briefs are shit. Only 10% of agencies think that clients are any good at writing briefs. But have you ever been told that as a client? Because I certainly haven't. And the law of averages says that I must have written some bad briefs over the time. So this whole other thing here about creating the right environment, the psychological safety for, for agencies and clients to challenge each other, right? We'll come back to that later on. And whilst we all think our own shit doesn't stink, there's a lot to be said for all of us, whether you're experienced or not, to take a step back and reflect on how we uh, brief our agency partners. And if our briefs are this shit, why would you copy and paste the last one? No one's done that, right? No one's copied and pasted a brief. So why is this important? And bear with me here, right? I'll get to the point. 33, um, uh, CMOs say they don't have enough money to make the work they want to make. 71%, according to this Gartner study, said they haven't got the budget to do what they want to do in this year, 2023. But what if I told you a great brief could fix that? What if I told you if I could increase your budget by a third? Well, that Better Briefs project that I talked about found that a third of every marketing budget is wasted on poor briefs and misdirected work. And there's a business called the AAR, who's uh, an intermediary between clients and agencies. They found in 90% of their deep dive client agency reviews that the quality of the, of the client brief was always a topic of debate. So it's an important thing to get right, okay? So it's a financial reward here. And there's an important distinction also between the client brief, the brief that I give my agencies, or you give your internal team, and the internal creative brief. We're talking about the client brief here. So what I do can't do is guarantee success, but I can give you some chances, some, some tips to, to improve your rate of success. The good news is that for me, a brief is just a process. And uh, this is this is the process, a six step process. You've got your objectives lined up. You've got your a, a target audience understanding and insight. Um, you've got an understanding of the moments you want to um, intervene and the messages you might want to share. Uh, you've got a, a moment where you write the brief, where you work out who your stakeholders are and the, where the approvals sit and then how you share that that brief. <clears throat> so it's a recipe but with all good recipes. There's room for some individual flair and genius, right? You can take the discipline and the rigor of this process and add a sprinkling of your, your own je ne sais quoi. So I, I subscribe to uh, the, the, the three-step process that Mark Ritson talks to, this idea of market orientation, diagnosis, strategy, and tactics. And I use that process with, with my own clients, right? But this brief here is a moment when you're moving from strategy, that second phase, into tactics. You're summarizing your market orientation, your brand positioning, what all the thinking you've done, <clears throat> and you're setting out what it is you want to achieve and how you think you're going to do it. So it's a summary of all those steps and a lot of thinking. You don't bang out a great brief on the train between Cambridge and Norwich. So buckle up. Here we go. First up, how are we going to set some objectives? What is it that you're setting out to achieve? <clears throat> Now, brief should connect your overall brand and your business strategy to the specifics of the project that you're briefing today. So if you think about what is the red thread that connects your brief, your project, to something that the business is trying to achieve, which should be a tangible commercial outcome. So we're not doing this for fun. As an aside, I'll come back to this again later on. As an aside, you might be surprised to hear how many award entries that I read have no clear commercial objective. You could, side tip, you could you set yourself apart if you're entering awards by having an actual objective in there. And you'll get stakeholder buy-in, you'll get board level buy-in if you're aligning your projects to the business's delivery. So as an example, when I was uh, working on the Bulmers brand, Heineken wanted to grow their market share. That's a commercial objective from the business. But Bulmers was losing share at that time to Magnus, Copperberg and Recordlick, the traditional cider of Magnus and the new sort of fruity ciders of Recordlick and Copperberg. So broad business objective to grow share. The brand objective for Bulmers was to increase penetration with our target audience. And the specifics of that then ended up in several briefs. There was a repositioning brief first. There was then some pack design, some NPD, comms, 
yada, 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 right? And so you can see where the brand was on the left, and then on the right is where uh, my project got us. And again, it's, I think it's moved on again since then, but it's, it's not a million miles from there. <clears throat> right, so I'm gonna try and bring this process to life with a consistent example, and I've chosen Old Spice because that's the some of the most famous advertising in the world. So we all know the Old Spice advertising. I've retrofitted a brief, okay? So I think the, the one thing we can say with certainty is it's not right. I've retrofitted a brief based on the work to try and illustrate these points. And that, it will be on the website, so you can download that and read it. But please, it's it's retrofitted. It's, it comes with a mahusive caveat. So I think their business objective could be something like PNG wanting to grow their share of the body wash market by uh, growing the Old Spice body wash brand by X. Okay, so some tangible numbers in there. And uh, they were they were facing at that time increased competition from new entrants and established brands like um, I think Dove for Men and Axe. But um, the consumer objective, I'm a fan of, of breaking the consumer objective into a, a tangible number here, so, so something like this, was to get X thousand of their target audience to buy Old Spice for the first time, so it's a penetration uh, gain, in the next year by showing them that Old Spice was a scent for, for modern man. Because Old Spice simply wasn't being considered. It was, see, it was outdated. It was seen as something for their grandfathers and fathers, not for the, for the modern man. So that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was step one. Still got some John Smith glasses here. Very handy. Um, step two is, uh, is about our consumers, our drinkers, our customers. They should be at the forefront of our minds as marketeers. It's our job to champion them, to be their voice inside our business in the same way that a sales team would be the champion of, of the retailer. And I think there are a number of different audiences that we could, could consider when thinking about our target audiences. There's the total market. They're all category buyers. It's an Ehrenberg Bass thinking, right? Ultimately, they're the people who are most likely to buy our product. Then you've got your media target, which should be, in my opinion, as close to the total category as possible for the budget you have available, okay? So think about the mental availability. This is growing mental availability yeah, in, in Ehrenberg Bass thinking. <clears throat> so our job is to be as close to always on for as large an audience as possible with the budget available. And for media, that could be traditional, outdoor, TV, radio. It could be digital. It could be your social media posts. It could be in-store. It could be sampling, et cetera, et cetera. So think, think broadly about your media target. And then your creative target, your creative muse, if you like. And I think you can be spikier here because in reality, it's very hard to turn a consumer off through communications. So if you think about compare the market and go compare. Intensely irritating advertising. They seem to be doing all right. So your description here should be attitudinal, behavioral, situational. You know, when's your product or service relevant to your target audience, not demographic? Okay, so a genuine target audience that I wrote, I saw in uh, a couple of months ago in some awards entries that I was right, I was reading, said that we have refined, we have refined our audience to all genders between twenty three and sixty five. Thank goodness they refined it to that. <clears throat> and also be mindful not to make these sort of broad sweeping generalizations, which are sometimes incorrect from your own perspective, right? Because you're often not the target audience. So again, in that same exercise, I read about the target audience that was 55 plus. Uh, and the reason they'd chosen traditional media was because, and I quote, 55 plus people have trouble using the internet. What? It's clearly not written by someone of my age, right? Because, uh, yeah, I think we're on the internet now, I believe. Um, but just think about your parents, for goodness sake, if you're not that old. So, so yes, avoid those sort of uh, um, errors. But I think this, all, so I'm talking here about consumer marketing. Think also about B2B marketing. And I think it also holds true for that. So a B2B customer is still a human being who can be described along with their pain points your media choices and some of the messages might be different along the way, but 
the human who sits behind the job title is uh, is still your target audience, your muse. So our job is to have this deep understanding of our target audience, to get a killer insight that unlocks the brief. So we all know it's important, but how do you know if you've got a good one? So this is something that I've used uh, with my clients, I've used in the past, this ACE test on, uh, on whether uh, an insight is, interest, is, is, is useful, any good. Is it, does it apply broadly to a target audience? Is it connecting the benefit, your product or service benefit to your target audience? And is it exciting? Does, does it get the creative juices flowing? So now is not time to be clever with words, with double meanings and little asterisks and brackets and things. Clarity and precision is what we need in the target audience. So this, uh, in that Bulmers example I, I mentioned earlier on, we had a target audience we called Generation Why Not, a unisex audience, opening open to trying new things to experimentation they were perhaps finding their way uh on the up the greasy pole of the career path they were entrepreneurial they were um using technology in new ways at the time it's a long time ago now right? but they were making mercury prize winning music in their bedrooms with this technology and their attitudes to cider importantly were very different to what we had previously thought they were much more open to trying new things so as part of that repositioning, that led to the following piece of NPD and an advert featuring Plan B. Remember him. Introducing Bulmer's number 17, made with crushed red berries, lime and over 100 years of experience. To launch it, we're awarding experimental people. Excuse me, my friend's band, they're playing about an hour around the corner. Guys, are you, uh, are you guys with? Take a chance. No? Yes! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend's band, Plan B! See the full performance, bulmers.co.uk. So you can see how the insight I think, played out in the ad there. <clears throat> so I think there could have been a couple of insights in this old spice brief. The first at the time this was written is the realisation that, that the majority of men's body wash was being bought by the women in their lives. Uh, and the fact that those women, the second insight, want their men to smell like a modern manly man, not like their dad. So we take that second one there. Does that apply broadly for target audience? Well, we know there are women in, in this piece of work. So yes, it does. Does it connect the benefit of the modernized brand and the new smell of the brand to a target audience? Well, yes, it does. It makes it relevant to them. And it most definitely excited the team because you've seen the body of work that came out. It was an incredible body of work. <clears throat> so we know what a brand needs to achieve and who we're talking to. So what's the optimum moment to talk to them? So I'm going to share a version of a path to purchase, a shopper journey, a, a purchase funnel uh, in a second. I'm well aware of the arguments against those, right? Um, they do have limitations. Purchases aren't made in this sort of linear way. People jump around all over that process. But I find using something like this helpful. It helps to focus where the problem is, helps to focus your brief. It gives clarity on, on what the prioritized job you need to do might be. There are a number of different models. This is one we used at, at Arla Foods and I've used with uh, some of my existing clients. I've used it in my own business, for example. So it can be used in a, in a B2B, just this idea of uh, being aware to consideration to purchase and repurchase, okay? And data is important in each of these moments. So understanding how many people are aware of you, are not aware of you, etc. How many people will consider you or not consider you? And then you can look at what the big decay points are in that, and then think about the message you might serve people to overcome those decay points. And that message could be served in the form of um, packaging, in point of sale, advertising, social media, whatever. So for example, at Weetabix, uh, we had, they still have a very strong prompted awareness. 98% of the UK population is aware of, of Weetabix. And they have very strong consideration, but the penetration wasn't where I wanted it to be. It wasn't where I believed it should be. It was a large decay between consideration and purchase. When we looked into it, we found that it was our visibility in store that was a problem. We were just getting outspent by our competition, our bigger spending competitors. So this is how we resolved that. We unlocked a 300% increase in feature space by doing a deal with the men's and women's football teams from all the home nations in the Republic of Ireland. And that feature space delivered a two percentage points growth of uh, uh, on Weetabix in the in the four or five month period we ran this, that's 700,000 more shoppers. It's a lot of people, right? It was a very commercially uh, successful 
piece of work. So you got the who and the when, but what about the what? What's the message you need to serve people? So category entry points should be our, our guide here. I should also again say, this is Ehrenberg Bass thinking, I, I got a message on LinkedIn from uh, Byron Sharp slapping my wrists once for not being clear enough about some thinking they had done. So just to be clear, in case he's listening, this is Ehrenberg Bass thinking, can you imagine my heart rate when that message came in, right? <laughs> Through the roof. So once we understand what the key drivers are in our category, um, think about what people are thinking about when they consider our category, you can um, you can you create the right the right messaging. So back in the day when I was in the in the brewery game, refreshment was important for lager. Uh, in food, it's normally always taste. Does your product taste great? I'm working with a cereal company at the moment called Spoon, and their whole philosophy is about being unapologetically tasty. I mean, and their ruthless focus on creating just simply the best tasting granola there is. You need to try it. Is inspirational. Their founders are inspirational. And for ale, the smooth ale, unsurprisingly, the key driver of purchase was smoothness. So we then uh, created a packaging brief where we put the pint with a smooth little flop of foam on the on the top there on the on the outer cases because previously it just been pictured the cans or logos. So I don't have the results. You can tell this was a long time ago by the pixelation on this image, right? But uh, it was a long time ago. But trust me, it was a very positive impact that that small change had on on that business. So in this example, I think the moment that matters for Old Spice was consideration. They just weren't seeing Old Spice as being relevant for uh, for their men anymore. So they needed to think about it being as a fragrance for their man, from going from being embarrassed to being confident in purchasing that that product, from seeing it as a modern smell, from from being old fashioned. And whilst in the that download I've got, uh, it's a comms brief I've written. It could easily have been a packaging brief or a point of sale brief because the top half of the brief is going to be broadly the same, right? You've got the business objectives and the challenges for the brand, but then the deliverables for um, a packaging agency or a TV ad or a social media post are going to be different, but the, the starting point is, is very similar. <clears throat> so moving on to the next thing, which is about writing, writing the brief. So shout out to Kevin Chesters here, who wrote an article a long time ago about how agencies and clients can work better together. And he challenged, he channeled his inner vanilla ice and talked about stop, collaborate and listen with each other. So uh, I, I love that. But collaboration is key, right? And that means working together, no one party being subservient to the other. You need to get the right people in a room to thrash it out. Yeah, ideally in a room to get a, to thrash that um, brief out together. By all means, go in with a straw man because um, it's easier to talk about something that exists already, right? And you can build on that. But be prepared as a client to change and to be open to challenge from your agencies because you need to create that right environment, right? For them to, to challenge you back. So we need to uh, allow that 90% of agencies who think our agencies are, our briefs are rubbish to challenge us. And collaboration doesn't mean watering down or compromising. It means listening and being properly understood. But ultimately, someone has to make a decision. So I carried out some research into this uh, um, a couple of years ago and I asked marketing leaders from agencies and clients to talk about the drivers of their best relationships. And there was one clear winner. 40% of everybody in the, in the open response talked about a mutual understanding of each other as the key reason. You get that by understanding the business and the brand, of course, right? But also understanding the human that sits behind that job title. So for the, the agencies in the room, are those people confident? Are they risk averse? Are they worried about their job? Are they frustrated in their job? Are they looking to make a name for themselves to become famous? And by understanding those things, you can unpick the unwritten parts of the brief, the hidden stuff in there, which will help you judge the work you might want to pitch. So again, perhaps a, a show of virtual hands here. How many people on this call have worked on the other side of the, the relationship? So if you're a brand marketeer, have you worked agency side and vice versa? Have you worked, um, have you worked uh, if you're an agency side, have you worked on, on the brand side? We're getting quite a few boats coming yeah. through. <laughs> okay, so, and if, and if you have, you've put your virtual hand up here. How many have done it for more than six months? Now, Typically, 
when I ask that in a room, I get about a 10% response rate. It's about 10% of people say, yeah, okay, I've, I've done it. I've, I've walked the walk. But it's only 10%. So it's not a surprise, right, that we don't really understand each other. I don't really understand my agency partners. And so it's important for us to be open and vulnerable and share those things. We haven't walked a mile in each other's shoes. So I said, remember, it's a, it's a, a collaborative process. And the best practice is to, um, to work on it together. But as a client, you need to remember it's your document. It's your contract or agreement with the agency, okay? But we need to work together to make sure the agency are excited by it, that the brief has been stress tested and that every word has earned its place. It's called a brief, okay? Not a long. So every word, be tight on that. And that every word in there is understood. And this was a great insight that came out of a, a brief writing training session I ran with a large branded business recently. I think this encourages clarity. Just keep your pens on the table until you've had a discussion. And then when you've agreed it, then you write it down. Our job here is to be single-minded and focused. And now is also the time you might want to put in the brief any mandatories or legalities, etc. the boring stuff. So we're getting through here, approving the brief. How do you work with stakeholders in a way that keeps everyone friends uh, and everyone happy? And you can learn from my bitter experience here. So remember, this will help you that uh, uh, if you can remember this at the start of the, the process and link this back to this uh, idea of um, a, a broader business objective, you get the right stakeholders on board, you, you'll, that will help you. So you're linking your project to this bigger, bigger objective. So there's a power uh, in a robust racy. I know it's boring. I know it's boring, but, but trust me, it makes a, it's a game changer. So just to, to walk us through this, R, who's responsible for doing the doing? And you can have numerous R's in, uh, in the process, in each, in each job that needs to be doing. But you can only ever have one person who's accountable. Only one person can make the decision. C stands for consulted. So these are people you need to, to speak to and you need to take on board their feedback and build that into your brief or your, the thing you're doing. Then I. You need to let them know what's going on, keep them informed, but you don't need to do anything with that, okay? So you don't have to listen to what they say. I don't know if everyone uses one already, but if you establish this before the project starts, before the emotion kicks in, that's the game changer here. And it avoids you getting to a bland, beige piece of work, whether that's a brief or something else, uh, because that's boring, okay? So it, it helps you define who decision makers are, whose opinions are important and whose are interesting, but ultimately irrelevant. So if you remember the saying, you've got to be in at the start to bin at the end. It's an old sort of marketing saying, and that helps you to think about if this person's got the authority to scupper my plans at the end of the project, then I need to engage them early. And let's agree who the decision maker is on this. I also love this example. Uh, uh, I believe it's Lord of the Rings. I've not read the Lord of the Rings, uh, but I believe it's Lord of the Rings. I've taken it from the internet and I've seen it on a load of different websites. So I've got no idea who did it first. If you know who did it first, I'll happily put the credit on the bottom. The other thing with approvals is to ask people to stay in their swim lanes. So you give people clear parameters for their, their feedback. Okay, so I'm not interested in whether the legal team thinks this brief is on brand or not. What I am interested in is their legal perspective on whether I'm infringing IP or whether there's some regulatory issues I need to consider. But it's not their fault if they haven't been asked the right question. So how many of us, I'm, I'm guilty of this, how many of us forward on the brief to, to people who need to, to see it, say, for feedback? Or do we ask a specific question in their area of expertise? Because people want to help. They want to say something, but what we want is something that's a bit more focused. So for example, if you're sending it to a sales director, you might ask them, will this packaging brief help us secure listings with a retailer? Will this excite your buyers? You're not saying for feedback. Last tip is about sharing the brief or running the collaboration session, whether it's a, a pitch situation or that collaboration session, because clients get the work that they deserve. The theatre. For me, it's all about creating that right environment for collaboration. But you need to recognise it takes a bit of effort. But when you do that, you get discretionary effort. You get, you get this, right, when you create the right environment. 
but it doesn't need to be expensive or flashy. It can be as simple as an in-store safari. I've run a, a briefing session in the meeting room at an Asda, and we've gone down and looked around the store. It could be an all-agency briefing in a pub. It could be a mocked-up retailer shelf in your office. It could be a high street trawl around the stores for inspiration, or it could be in a box at the race course like we did for John Smith's. But your job is to bring to life the challenge that's sitting in, in that brief because you're in competition with all the other clients in that agency, right? You want that discretionary effort. You want the, the shower thinking time because the other clients in the agency are in the 90% of ones who are giving shit briefs, but you're not, right? You're not anymore. I think some of that can be seen in, in this work that uh, WCRS did for us when uh, we were, I was working on Anchor. That was a pitch situation and we briefed everyone at, um, at Borough Market. And we sent them off with some money to go and buy and experience these different foods to because we, we believed in the melting pot this fantastic melting pot of british modern british culture that brings everything together and i think you can see that in in the work that, that came out of this uh franca everything tastes better with with butter on it right so a bonus tip my final thought uh, if you like clarity just make a decision right clarity is about um a great strategy and great strategy is about about sacrifice if you've got two things you want to talk about that's two briefs there's always a, a valid rationale for doing either thing having e either message but the best thing you can do is to make a choice and commit this is Cantar Mill with that brown data via Tom Roach, who's at, at BBH, showing that the most effective messaging strategy you can have is to have one message per execution. When you add in more messages, it dilutes. It may seem appealing to have more messages, but it doesn't work. Two messages, two briefs, two executions. And never use TBC in a brief. Just this is the confirmation, all right? So they were, they were the top tips we've, uh, we've been through. You've seen the, the six step process. Hopefully I've brought it to life with some examples. Um, and I said, I've created a page on my website. So bigblackdoor.com forward slash TMM. Uh, and you can find the deck, uh, these templates, some examples, etc. You can get in touch with me there too, if you wanted to carry on the conversation or, or on long LinkedIn. I'm fairly prolific on LinkedIn. So I'm happy to, uh, happy to connect there. So uh, that's it. Thank you. I'm happy to take any easy questions about <laughs> this or uh, or anything else. No difficult ones, please, Joe. You're the, you're the arbiter of this. Yeah, I'm I'm going to pick out the hardest ones. You know, just to <laughs> to make it a horrible horrible experience. Thank you so much, mate. And like just that last little bit at the end there, where you're like, oh yeah, by the way, here's everything as a template. Blooming <laughs> useful. Like really appreciate that as well. So so thank you very much. We'll make sure we uh we link um to to all the resources you pre uh, presented uh, in the follow-up email so folks have got that link as well mm -hmm. so what a boy thank you very very much um let's get going with some uh questions uh so we've got 10 open questions uh and i'm not going to quote todd in the chat right now uh speaking about uh making a decision and that being the unofficial step number eight um so <laughs> uh, let's go uh with anonymous first because this has been the one that was sort of gravitating to the top for most of today's session uh which was how do you write a brief without over directing the creative to allow the agency to do their job and so you've spoken a lot about making the brief brief uh but you've also made spoken about making it very concise and 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 uh with with an iron precision so how do you strike that balance uh between giving space and being precise um but i think you're being precise about about the challenge not the solution you might have some ideas about the solution um but the precision comes in 
in pinpointing so that in that Weetabix example, the precision there is, well, look, we've got a problem with our visibility in store um, and we we need to find a way to increase our visibility in store. So we collaborated with our agency teams. We collaborated with our, our sales teams. What is it? What is it that's going to unlock this this feature space that we're after here? We need uh, you need great point of sale, Gareth, and you need, in their words, a dirty great big hook is what they said. <laughs> then I went away and uh, we briefed a few people to find out what that dirty great big hook was, and it happened to be a deal with the uh, with the England team first, and then all the all the nations at a time when COVID had compressed had compressed the uh, the calendar to mean that we, for a, in a relatively short period of time we had a lot of tournaments that we could then activate in store. But the brief was how do I increase visibility in store, not how do I activate a, an England partnership? You see, you see the difference there. So, um, so I think I think it's quite I think it's. I think it's easy to, to to differentiate. I think you've got to just trust that your agencies are going to come up with some work. You give them the the, the tools, the information, the the challenge ahead because you're collaborating with them all the way through. This isn't a big tada moment. You shouldn't have any tadas in 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 marketing. It should be it should be collaborative. It should be iterative. You should you should be working together to get to these to get to the solutions. I love so that. you just got to keep yourself honest. And and your agencies, if you've got the right environment there. Your agency should be saying, "All right, guys, back off. Back off. This is, yeah, it's our job to write the script, mate, not yours." <laughs> I love that. You, you spoke from the perspective of having an agency or an internal team. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you've been going out to multiple agencies to work on a project, and you've had you've written the brief? Um, because it feels like that opportunity for collaboration possibly doesn't feel is there in the same situation because you or, or is it you know I, I've never done this before so yeah. I, I'd love to lean on your experience well let's, let's so in a pitch you know a, a pitch and let's be clear a pitch is an awful process it's it's when you're when you're an ABM just joining the business you think oh this is gonna be exciting it's a pitch this is what it's what you know they're gonna give me cake and stuff in all these meetings it's <laughs> it's awful it's a it's a, a it saps time and effort and emotion from everybody agency and client so pitch is to be avoided almost at all costs i've not i've got 25 years or whatever I've, I've probably done three or four pitches okay so it's not it's not an everyday occurrence so that's that's a slightly different a different thing but if you're if, if you've got a, a an established sort of roster of your agencies in um you've got a, a yeah a packaging agency a below the line agency you've got a um, you've got a TV agency, you've got a X, Y, and Z agency, right? All these different agencies. Um, the best practice, I believe, is to bring everyone together. So as a client in your, I'm probably talking about bigger clients here, right? Who've got this brand planning process that you go through, you have the kickoff meetings, you, you're doing all your assessment of the business objective and your brand objectives. When you got to that bit, yeah. then we have an all agency meeting and I bring everyone together and we'll say, okay, this is this is our thinking. This is the state of the nation for us at the moment. This is the challenge we've got for the long term. This is where we're going in five years' time. This is what this year looks like. And the top, you know, if you think about a brief, the top part of a brief is going to be broadly the same for everybody because that's a business challenge and the audience insight and that stuff. And then I'll be saying, okay, I'm now going to have sort of one-to-ones with each of the agencies to say, mm-hmm. and this is the bit I want you to look at. But you're all working together. You all heard the same thing. You all, you all, you're all in the in the room together. Um, but the sort of the actual budget you're giving each one is is probably a, a secret for 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 them. To, but, but I expect them to feed back on each other's work. I expect them to be working in the background together to collaborate together to come back with a unified response. I don't want to see five responses. I want to see one response with five sections. Nice. So I'm putting the onus on them to collaborate when I'm not in the room as well interesting i could imagine the same work in in a, a smaller business you know like if if you're looking to get the ceo on board uh you know the cfo it may not be that they go off and deliver the work but almost you're briefing in okay this is what i'm going to be doing even if yep. it's like a management meeting it feels like there's there's something there which uh feels really? like people could pick up on in that john smith example i gave um that 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 brief we had everyone in the room mm-hmm. We had a marketing director, so she's appeared. Sarah Warby was uh, was oh, nice. in that room. Um, we had the insights team. I had 
the media agency, the above the line creative agency. I had uh, shopper marketing. I had everyone in that in that room together, and we went through the straw man of what that brief looked like. But we challenged everything. It was a beautiful process. It was you know it's quite hard work because it's tiring to have every word challenged. But what we had then was a document that summarised a shared understanding of what the the challenge was, and had everyone sign up to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that back in the olden days when I was doing that, they were literally signed up to it, right? There was, <laughs> there was an actual pen on paper to, to say, this is the brief. We, we're agreeing to this brief now. And that, that's your, I, I believe, a lot in sort of um, ratcheting forwards. So that's a moment where you, you ratchet forwards then. And when you cut, when, if you have to click back, you're just clicking back to the brief. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, but it, it, this didn't happen. Sarah was amazing. But you, know, you could be saying, okay, Sarah, you're saying that now. Yeah. Let's go back to the brief that we agreed yeah it's, it's a bit different there so what is it is it do you, do you need to change the brief mm -hmm. or are we okay with the brief and that's then a much less emotional conversation to say i disagree with you and you're having a having a tear up that's you're going back to a document that you've all agreed at some point okay, we, we, we're changing that now nice. okay well if we are it's okay to change it let's just do it in in knowledge yeah that's really interesting to sort of think about it as a not just a output mechanism, but also a conversation mechanism to to go back to. That that's really useful. I've never really thought about it quite in that way before, but it feels really really useful. So thank you for showing that. There's um 15 open questions, so uh, I'm mindful that I should probably move to the next one. I'm going to take one from James because uh, it was in the same spirit as the the first question we asked, which was that um how can you get your agency to be looking for problems you're not thinking of rather than just following the brief e.g if you think that it needs awareness campaign but actually the opportunity is in store uh, uh, visibility is it again a similar question where it's like you just need to get them around the question uh around the table at the same time to help form the brief and then mm. you i think and i also think it's about creating the right culture mm -hmm. so you know i, I reference some some research that I, I might stick that in that link it's not on there at the moment i might stick stick that um that research in that white paper i wrote um but clients want challenge clients say oh yeah no i want my agencies to to challenge me i want them to to, to do that i want them to say no it's not it's not um it's not an awareness problem gareth it's an in-store problem um but you gotta you gotta look at yourself in the mirror and say am i creating the right environment for that to happen mm -hmm. or am i micromanaging them Am I saying, so you've said you've used uh, two and a half hours doing this thing, but I think it was only two hours, 25 minutes. <laughs> Is that the environment where someone's then go, oh, I'm going to challenge you now? Of course it's not, right? So I say clients get, clients get the agencies and the work they deserve. Mm -hmm. So you've got, to, you've got to step back. You've got to give people um, the space to challenge you, and you've got to encourage that challenge. You've got to reward it. You've got to... You've got to so yeah great you know that's a great let me have a think about that let me treat that with respect because people aren't putting their head above the parapet for fun they're not um they're not coming to work thinking do you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna i'm gonna do rubbish work today i'm gonna cause problems for gareth they, yeah. they're saying it because they believe that thing so you have to treat that with respect and and encourage it and you have to agree with it but you do have to you do have to create an environment where that's encouraged bang on you know it, it's funny so i i had some feedback the other day because I'm, I'm quite a sensitive person i know that will surprise you gary but, uh, <laughs> and and so because i'm quite a sensitive person someone said back to me that uh, i can be quite hard to give feedback to sometimes and that was really interesting you know because i i feel like i'm quite an open person mm. uh, in the same way as i'm sure everyone on this call does but actually exactly to your point i made a conscious choice in that moment where it was like okay even if i don't agree with the feedback you have to welcome it. You have to model it. So you you are able to give feedback to others, but then you have to reward it uh, yeah. when, when you sort of get it. And it was a, a real light bulb moment, moment for me. So um, it just so, speaks uh, volumes to me. There was, um, I, 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 in terms of feedback, there was a, an anecdote I heard Stephen Fry talking about once. And um, he was talking about when people say, like, after a show, go, oh, that lovely show, Stephen, well done. And he, he said, he used to go, oh, no, no, it was, it was, it, it wasn't a very good one but he said but that's their reality right so he changed his mindset just went thank you mm -hmm. you just say thank you don't you're not offering a, a judgment on that you're just saying thanks yeah that's it absolutely and most most 99 times out of 100 these things are given generously right mm -hmm. so, exactly that 
Um, let's take the next question from Anonymous. Um, so Anonymous asks, uh, what are some of the most effective techniques you use to collect data and insights that inform your briefs? Um, <laughs> big question. Depends how big your, depends how big your wallet is. Um, yeah. So I've used, you, you can, the number, number, you can go from a, a full Miller Brown brand tracking thing that will cost you a lot of money, right? And we, I've worked at Heineken, Weetabix, Arla, we have those, and that's you know, it's a lot of money involved there. But holy cow, the the the, the information is amazing, mm -hmm. um, amazing. So if you don't have that, you can you can do your own brand tracking. I've I've set up brand tracking surveys for for my clients for a couple of grand. I take the knowledge that I've got, you know, and there'll be people, other people like me, this isn't a pitch, right? But there are other, they're, take the knowledge and experience. And you go, okay, these are the things that we want to be tracking. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at, you want to benchmark before you do any of your, your work. And then you can track it, you know, you have a couple of dips, two dips a year or something like that, just to, to track that. That's not that expensive. You can often find insight in the business. Often the solution is in the business. You know, when you talk to the sales team, you know, what, why are customers not buying this thing? Or why are they buying this thing? You can talk to the, the, the distribution guy who, who says, oh, yeah, you know, I know um, that product always breaks. That's why it never gets reordered. It always breaks in transit. Okay, well, thanks for letting me know. So <laughs> you can find out these things by speaking to people. So you, there's a, a balance of getting out and about, speaking to... to the, the, an example, I was with... Um, week one at Weetabix and they send you out um, to go and talk to consumers in their in their homes not not awkward at all right so uh, <laughs> we went out and there's this guy um, and uh, we're chatting to him in his kitchen and we he didn't know where we're from but um, he said well, you know, I, just, I just want to watch you making your breakfast <laughs> um, yeah, yeah can you imagine the awkwardness of uh, you know me well enough to know Joe that that was hideous for me <laughs> so he's he's doing his Weetabix and um I said, um, do you have any problems with like the, the crumbs in the wheat? Because oh no, 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 he says, no, no. But when he's doing it, he's like he's like, opening it up like like this <laughs> and sort of pouring it in and uh, sort of sweeping the crumbs into his bowl. I'm thinking, your your body language says you, you do have some problems with the crumbs in, in wheat bix. Yeah. That was free. Oh, it could maybe cost thirty quid or whatever it was for an incentive for the guy to let me into watch him eating breakfast. But that's <laughs> anyone could do that. But that that was there's a moment there you go okay I, if you, you you're observing this thing you're seeing this thing happen and and that's uh that was a killer insight right that to to, to see the a, a tension between what someone says and what they do that's that's a killer insight in there mm, bang on thank you for that you know it it seems to be a reoccurring theme over the course of time that research can be incredibly cheap or incredibly expensive but you know it goes back to the cliche of speaking to your customers watching your customers you know, like if the if the main takeaway is <laughs> go and watch your customers eat breakfast, you know, like I'm happy for for that from today's session. <laughs> Maybe we'll stop there. Uh, right, next question from uh, Lucy. Um, so Lucy says, uh, "This is excellent." So thank you, Gareth. Um, Lucy asks, "Are there any resources you could recommend specific uh, to B two B specifically?" So folks are often pointing out mm. the difference between B two B and B two C. Uh, not that I can think off the top of my head, if I'm being honest. There's, I think Mark Ritson did a great, a great talk once on um, on sort of the similarities and differences between B two B, B two C. My field of expertise is B two C. I'm not, I can't pretend otherwise. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I'm doing a bit of B two B now, in my own business. Uh, so, um, but I'm not sure I've got a resource to, to share. I, I think there's a an article. I'll, I'll try and find it out, and uh, I'll stick a link if I can find it on. On that web page to that Mark Ritson uh, talk, you, you well, can, we can all do a lot worse than listen to Mark Ritson more. Hundred percent. And and so like, let's speak anecdotally then. So you know, just from your experience, rather than uh, feeling like uh, you have to be the the defining voice on this, given your experience in B two C and B two B, if you're doing a bit of B two B stuff now, does much change in your mind when when you're when you're going through this? Uh, yeah, that 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 sort of infinity loop I talked about. So. If I think about my business, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, well, who who are my target audience? I'm not gonna give any secrets away here. Right? Who who are who's buying my services? What what are the um, what's the audience description? So I've been working with uh, 
with someone called Louise, who's, who's another brilliant marketeer to help me do this. And um, she, we, we've defined a couple of a couple of audiences. Okay, so two two things, two briefs, right? So the audience one, we're thinking, okay, what what are their pain points? We know a bit about them. What are their pain points? And okay, when might they be experiencing that? When might they be then searching for help? And um, what part in the brand brand planning cycle or in their lives or uh, and therefore where are they searching for that help and what things could we tell them what things could we say about us that makes them think oh hang on you know gareth and big black door could help with this mm. so it's that's just that infinity loop from you know the reality is that very few people are aware of of me and my stuff and even fewer are considering it so there's an awareness and consideration job that's the that's the killer job for me to do nice. whether that's a uh, selling a, a box of cereal or selling my services as a marketing consultant it's the same it's the same principle hang on no you know i i i think i heard mr ritson liken the relationship between b2b to b2c to the same as a human and a chimpanzee and that they essentially um shared 98 percent of the same dna or, or or something like that that's a bad quote uh but it's a quote ish <laughs> so, uh, similar similar vibes um we've got three questions left uh so we'll, we'll make them a uh, quick fire here gareth um the first one can be an incredibly short answer as well so it comes from antoinette and antoinette asks uh how long would you expect your brief to be uh one one to two pages question yeah yes um so the template i've i've got is is one page but it's blank so um it's probably gonna be like a page and a half two pages no more than two pages there'll be some appendices right um that people can look at yeah. but again if they're collaborating over time they, they probably know all that stuff anyway but you might want to attach it for for completeness nice that's perfect perfect thank you um let's go to the next question from anonymous who asks uh how can we encourage clients not to put budget TBC in the brief, uh, which was a killer, a killer slide at the end, which was uh, delivered with punch and then and then moved moved on quickly. Uh, so, how can we encourage folks to uh, not put TBC in there? Don't, in their don't take the brief. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I Come can't. On. So, yeah, don't take the brief. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not complete. Yeah. Okay, nice. Okay, so would you feedback in in those instances and say, look, you know, the brief isn't complete if we don't have a budget, so right. we can't. So I'll give you an anecdote here. I'm going to try and sanitize this to protect people's identities, right? Um, so something happened in in one business I was working at, and um, one of the teams I was working with left TBC in budget, and I said to him, "You need to, we need to put a number in here," mm -hmm. and uh, we had. We had, uh, I think, 400 grand to spend on production, right? So it wasn't not shabby. Um, and we got some work back that we clearly couldn't afford. Right? The, 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 the first scripts came back and going, I'm going, we can't afford that. That's crazy. And um, I looked at the brief that had been given and it still had TBC in there. And the agency, uh, I said, we can't afford that. We've, we've only got four hundred thousand pounds to spend on uh, on production and i went oh i thought you had some ambition oh. <laughs> but if we'd if we'd put 400 grand in the budget we wouldn't have had that conversation right yeah. and we it, it, it was wasted effort and time and emotion just um yeah so we should have we should have i should have insisted uh, yeah i missed it i should have insisted that, that that tbc was not left in that budget and the agency should have insisted that um that it was completed before before they accepted it yeah, well, thank you for sharing that anecdote, though, because I think that's important because I, I think it can come across quite almost adversarial in a sense. You know, it's like, oh, the budget, uh, the, the brief isn't complete, you know, and you walk away. Yeah, I'm exaggerating, right? But, um, no, 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 but yeah. of course, like, actually, you know, to sort of put it in those terms, which is, you know, what this really benefits you if, if you put the budget in. That's 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 really quite something. So thank you for that. That's a uh, bang on. Um, and with that, I, th I think we'll, we'll, we'll call it. Mate, you smashed it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Like six steps, six practical tips, deliver the template on top of that and uh, blooming answers at the end as well. Mate, you, you're a legend. So thank you. For <laughs> thank uh, you. Like I think it's something that people could take for the rest of their career right there if, if, uh, if they're in any doubt on how to create a great brief. So appreciate the hell out of you. Thank you to everyone uh, for tuning in and, and for contributing 
as you have today. It's always a joy. Uh, thank you for your questions. I can see some lovely praise coming in for you, Gareth, right now. So <laughs> this is what they call filler. So you can just bask in in, in the thank yous because you deserve it. And, and the community uh, uh, deserve it too, because you're all blooming amazing. Uh, so with all that said, uh, we're back next Tuesday, uh, investigating the hot topic of, of the, the year. Um, how AI can save you time as marketers. Um, that's with Billy Jones, who's the VP of marketing at Hootsuite. So I hope to see you then for that. Uh, please do say thank you to Cambridge Marketing College and the rest of our sponsors if you have a moment. I'll link Gareth's resources after today uh, in the follow-up email. With all that said, just have a blooming wicked day. Thank you so much, everyone. And cheers, Gareth. Take care, everyone. <laughs>